Okay. So this session is going to be more on unit testing with Python. Uh, so before we start on, I think we need to discuss about what unit testing is and why we would, why we would need uh, unit testing for our code or for our scripts that we are going to write. Uh, just to ask you something, how many of you have struggled in the first day or uh, in the past days because you weren't getting the exact output that you were expecting to. Uh, for example, there was... So if I go to the repo, In the, in the fixed extract data frame, uh, you're finally expecting to get uh, the zipped file or the, the, the zip of every uh, functions that were that you created above. So the created out, the source, the text, the polarity, the language, and every methods returned uh, a list of each tweet and it, it was finally zipped using the zip uh, method from Python and you created a data frame from, from, from the created uh, zip class. So how many of you have struggled when, try, when trying to create this zip or when trying to call this zip method from Python? Because some of the methods weren't the way that you expected them or some of them were returning then. Can I, can I see some hands up? Okay. Okay. Yeah. So I think uh, most of you have been struggling with that. Uh, we can see that from the Slack group. That's because we were writing uh, a code segment and we were expecting it to return in some way, right? Uh, for example, we were expecting the find retweet count to return the retweet counts of all the tweets, the hashtags to return the hashtags of all tweets, the mention to return uh, the, the code section or the mentions in all tweets. And we were expecting it to work, but it wasn't working as we expected. So today we are going to discuss about the unit testing concept. I hope some of you are already familiar, but uh, we are going to look more into detail about what unit testing is in the different types of unit testing frameworks that we can use to test our codes before executing them and uh, some best practices of writing unit tests. Let me make it uh, into a full screen and we can, yes. So unit testing is a software testing method by which individual components of software source code are put under various tests to determine and identify bugs and whether they are fit for us. So after writing the methods or the necessary functions that we need for our program. What unit testing does is it tries to go over each uh, function or each method or in our class and check if they are returning the, the return values that we expect them. They will not only check the return uh, uh, types, but they will also check if they are valid, if they are giving a valid output, not in terms of return type, but also their values and the types and also the class that contains all of the scripts. So normally what we would do or what you guys might have been doing is uh, we will print the value and match it if uh, it was the reference output or check the output manually. So some of you might have been doing uh, the print statement, might have been using the print statement so that to check if each of the functions or each of the methods were returning the, uh, the valid outputs that we are expecting them. For example, we were trying to check, you might have been trying to check the find favorite count and what someone will normally do without unit testing is he or she will try to print the return type of this specific method and will try to validate if it is uh, the right type of uh, return type that we are expecting. Uh, okay, I think I'm the only admin here. Okay, sorry for that. Okay, so, but when you try, when you start to write unit tests, what we'll do is we'll 
taste each of the meters in our class or in the function that we wrote and uh, validate if they are the correct type. So for a simple function that we write, I think it's really easy. For example, if you have a function which returns the sum of two numbers, for example, let's say A and B, it's very easy to, it's, uh, it's very easy to check uh, if we are getting the correct output or not. But when it comes to a larger program, even the project that you are going to use, it's more harder to taste each of the methods that you have in class. As your program gets uh, more complicated and there, there are going to be more classes and more methods inside each class, it's going to be hard to check if each output of the methods or if each of our class works as we, are, as we expect them. So that's why we are going to use uh, unit taste. So there are different types of methods or different frameworks to use for unit testing. The first one is unit test. The first one is uh, unit test. Unit test is a built-in uh, module in Python and we can use it directly without installing any other package. It used to be the popular, I think it's still the popular and uh, most used uh, framework in unit test, but I mostly prefer to use PyTest. It's a third party framework. Uh, and you, you, you'll have to install PyTest and Noise. I think this is Noise, if I'm not wrong. I haven't used noise yet, but uh, I'm more, uh, I, I mostly work with unit test and PyTest. Uh, and unit test, it's built in module in Python. And once you get Python, it's, uh, you can import it directly without installing any other package. And uh, in unit test, how you, how you can test each of the methods that you have or the test cases that you have written is by using the Python minus N, the new test, and to test a specific method inside a class, you will specify the test module or the module name that you wrote or the file name that you wrote, then the class name inside the test module, and finally the method name that you want to test. This is to test a single test or uh, to check for a single test case. And if you want to check all of the tests that are in the module or in the file that you wrote, you can uh, simply write the Python minus n and unit test, then the module name or the file name. And using PyTest, uh, after you install PyTest, you first have to install PyTest. The PyTest installation is like pip minus pip install minus u PyTest. Uh, after you install the module using py, uh, pip, let me explore and uh, to test a single uh, module or a single method, I'm sorry, a single method, you will use the command pytest minus k. Minus k will specify that for pytest that you are going to test a single method in the class. And finally, uh, and finally, uh, the method name that you want to test. And you can also use noise. I'm not sure if the name is correct, but I haven't used that. But you have options to use, you have different options to use for testing. And yes, as you have said earlier, unit test is built in into Python standard library and it's some, it has some requirements before uh, it runs. Uh, the first thing is you have to put your tests into class as methods. It's not a must, you can, uh, you can simply put your tests in a script or in a, in a normal file and you can run the test. But the best practice that we have to do is we have to put the class we have to put our test in a class and inside the class you can uh, create separate tests and we can uh, put multiple methods for different functions that we want to test and use a series of special assertions method in your test. We can go over this and there are different assertion methods that we can use in your test and using each method we can test our different functions. So these are the methods that we can use uh, to test or validate that the output of the functions that we are going to test uh, are in order that we want them to be. So the assert equal will test if they, uh, if after passing two parameters, if the two parameters are equal and assert not equal will test if the two parameters that pass to them to, to it isn't equal. And it has other functions as well. For example, one thing we'd want to do is uh, if you, we want, we, we may, we might want to check if the return type of a function or a method is an instance of maybe let's say a tuple or a list. So uh, maybe in the Twitter challenge, you, are, you, you might test if 
the return type of one of the methods in the class that you are going to test is uh, a type is an instance of a list and we can use assert is instance of and assert not instance of in different other uh, methods that are in the unit test maybe i will drop this in the chat uh, okay is that the question and i Okay, I will continue. Uh, so, how to structure a simple test? So, what do you have to do to uh, start writing tests? So, before you dive into writing tests, you'll have to, you'll want to make first a couple of decisions. Uh, the first thing is you want to know what you want to test, what you have to test. So, in the Twitter challenge, you first have to identify what you want to, to test. There are multiple methods. In different classes, there is the class for uh, extracting the data, and there is also a class uh, for pre-processing the data or cleaning the data. You might also write additional classes which will pre-process the data or for visualization and different other things that you want to work on the data. So you first have to write, identify what you want to say. So identifying what you are going to work on or what you want to test is the first step because it will make the testing process or writing the test cases much more simpler and efficient. So the second thing is, are you writing any test or an integration test? We will not be covering integration test, but integration test is uh, a type of testing, but here you will test different units combined together or different components of your program or, or your application combined together. But you, in unit test, you are going to test a very specific methods or a specific functions uh, in your classes, in your class, and validate if they are returning the right outputs that you want them. So uh, to structure, you will first create your inputs and execute the code being tested and capturing the output, and finally comparing the output with the expected result. What this means is that you will first uh, create the expected outputs or what the code that you wrote or the function that you wrote or the method in a class uh, that's written uh, you want to return, and that's the expected case then you'll capture what the function or the method really returns. For example, let's say you have a function that returns the sum of two numbers. So you'll first put what you expect after inputting two numbers, let's say two and three. So you will expect the function to return five, right? Then the next step is executing the function or executing the method in a class. So after executing, you'll get uh, a specific output, for example, when adding two numbers, you'll get uh, five. Then after, after adding two and three, you'll get five. And you'll finally compare the output that you got in step two with the input or with the expected, with your expected uh, input that you place uh, before writing, before executing the code that you want to test. And finally, you will compare it and, or you'll make an assertion if the test is passing or not. So it has a lot of advantages, it helps you to detect to detect bugs early in the development cycle. It helps you to write better programs. It syncs easily with other testing methods and tools. And your program as a whole will have fewer bugs and it will be easier to modify in future with very less constraints. Because as your program uh, starts growing more and more, uh, you'll have to make sure uh, that each of the section or each of the Uh, okay, sorry. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, no, yes. Can. Okay. yes, yes. Great. Uh, so uh, I think we can now see a bit uh, more into the practical session. Uh, we have seen that, uh, is it clear before we go to the uh, hands-on uh, exercise 
what unit testing is or why you would need unit testing. Is it clear or is it not clear? Okay. Okay, so it's clear for everyone. Okay, nice. So I think let's start uh, writing uh, some tests. We are going to, uh, I'm going to start uh, writing a very simple test at first. And after we get a hang of it, we can uh, go to writing more complex tests and even something related to uh, the project that you'll be working on. So uh, as I have said earlier, there is a standard in writing unit tests. And normally, as you have also seen in the challenge document, you will have uh, a folder test. This isn't mandatory, but uh, when, when using PyTest and uh, other, some other uh, frameworks of unit testing, it requires you to put all of the test configuration in a uh, file named test or in a folder named test because it will go or it will look in your program. It will uh, go and try to look for any folder that's, uh, that, uh, that's matched with the name test and it will run all of the tests in it that start your state. I think we'll see more into that. And you might put you, your scripts, for example, you, let's say your uh, processing scripts or any other cleaning modules in a script. And what tests will include is, it will include all of the test modules that you want to test uh, for the functions that are in scripts uh, folder. So let me first simply create a, a, a simple script. And what this script will do is, it, it won't be in a class or it won't be in an object-oriented uh, way, but we'll try to see in a, a script or a module in, an, in that way for, uh, later. But for now, let's just under, try to understand the concept of uh, unit testing uh, using very simple functions. Let me just say that this is a simple script. And uh, first, let's say that we have uh, a function, for example, Uh, we have a very simple function that will return the average uh, of two numbers. So we are expecting two numbers. Both of them should be an integer. And what they have, what they are, what this function is supposed to return is an integer. And this is going to be very simple. We should uh, calculate the. Uh, we should calculate the average of the two numbers given. So when you give this program two numbers, it will uh, simply calculate the average and return the result. So what you do normally, uh, as we've been talking earlier, what you'd normally do or how you'd normally check if this uh, function is returning the correct type is you'll print the result uh, of find average. By passing, uh, for example, one and one. One plus one is two, two over two is one. And this should return one, right? Python scripts, simple scripts. Uh, oh. One plus one, two. Uh, in return, uh, A plus B, not A divided oh, by B. Yes, thank you. Thank you. So A plus B, it's, it's returning one. This is valid. And for this kind of program, it's OK to write uh, uh, this kind of print statements. But as your program grows, we can't make sure that every return statements or every function that we wrote uh, is working as we expect them. So that's why we are returning or we are writing uh, unity. So in the test case, in the test scripts, we can create a new, a new function, which will paste the simple scripts. So the other standard is in tests, every test script needs to start with test. So as I have said earlier, especially for PyTest, what PyTest will try to do is it will try to look for folders that start with tests. And after going into the folder test, it will try to look for other uh, file names that start with tests. So if your file name or if your test script that you are going to write or your test module that you are going to write doesn't start with tests, PyTest won't go into that or won't uh, try to uh, run the test in that module. So you need to make sure that your folder first, your folder should start, should be named tests. 
and your modules should start with test. So uh, we are going to uh, write a very simple test in here. We are going to import unit test. As I said earlier, unit test is a built-in module, so we don't have to uh, import any, we don't have to uh, install any other package or third-party package. You can import it directly if you have Python. Okay, scripts for... So after uh, importing the unit list, what we have to do now is we have to import uh, the find average function that we wrote in the simple script into test simple scripts because we are going to test or we are going to write a test that validates the output of the simple uh, the, in, the, in the module simple script, which is the find average, is correcting properly. So to import that, since in Python, I think you guys are already familiar with that uh, in Python, directories or modules have to be in, 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 a, in the same directory to be able to import those modules. But now the module is one directory up and then the script or the module is inside the scripts folder. So what we are going to do is we are going to import sys so that we can uh, import that or we can add that uh, specific module to the pass of the system. So we, we are going to append that pass Paint the pass. Uh, maybe I can paint the working directory, and inside testing demo, testing demo is the root directory. We can go to the scripts folder so that now in our pass we have access to the simple scripts. Normally in Python, the system pass is going to point to the current directory that you are in, or it will just try to look for the uh, for other built-in modules. If, for example, if I try to import uh, from simple scripts, import find average, I'm going to import uh, find average from simple uh, scripts. This is not going to work because the first thing it will try to do is it will try to find it in the current folder. If not, it will assume that maybe it is a built-in module and it will uh, try to look in the Python uh, configurations or in the Python files that, that, that that's defined. So we need to add the path of the scripts so that it will look for this specific module inside the scripts folder. So now this uh, should work. And now, as I've said, the best way or the best structure to arrange your scripts for, or test scripts is to create a class for the, say, for the test scripts. For now, I'm just going to call it a test simple scripts and since we are going to use unit test i'm going to show you both ways both methods to use uh, using unit test and uh, pytest so we need to initialize the class using unit test dot test case so now we, we can uh, run our scripts or we can write we can run uh, our tests using the unit test and the first thing that we want to do is because we now know what we are going to run or we now know what we want to test we are going to write uh, a test case to, uh, to be able to validate the output of the find average uh, function that we wrote in the simple script. So we are going to name our name, find simple find average, and it is going to uh, this is going. Uh, to run this find average and it will try to validate the output that it gets with the actual or with the expected output. So uh, our expected output is uh, five. For example, when we run uh, two numbers together, we are going to add them and we are going to uh, calculate the average. So the actual result is find average. We have imported find average, find average of two numbers. Uh, for example, let's say, uh, I think we should use the previous inputs and the average of the two numbers is one. And the expected case is what you are expecting uh, to get as a return uh, after running this average, after running this function. And the actual variable holds what the, the function actually returns. And finally, what you can do is you can assert 
sorry, assert equal and the actual with the expected one. So this is the assert equal is in the unique case that I've shown you earlier from the site, and it will check if the two arguments that's passed to it are equal. If they are not equal, this will return uh, false and this will return an exception. So how we can write, how we can, how we can run our case is simply by using Python minus M unit test and test simple scripts. Uh, no module named simple scripts. Sorry, this is simple script. Okay, so now you can see that run one test and it's okay. Uh, maybe let me uh, make it the expected output. Uh, let me just uh, change it to two and if I now run it, it says it's failed. Is, is that a question? And does it work? Okay, Sanna or Yasabna? Um, should, should, should we know the expect export? Yes, we, we are we're, not we're that uh, expected is uh, as we are taking expected as a given or as known from uh, the test uh, find average function. Yes, uh, what we mean by expected is we are trying to put the variable or the return type that we expect the function to return. Uh, for example, you might. I think we'll see this in a more complex programs, but you will have to put a sample of the data that you expect. Uh, for example, when you are going to run some kind of test case in a pandas data frame, you will take a sample of the data frame, maybe let's say uh, the top five, for example, you have a data frame uh, X, and what you are going to do is you might take the top five, uh, the top five uh, rows of the uh, pandas data frame, and you are going to validate or you are going to test if these returned rows are equal with your expected input. Mm, this means we can call the function inside the test function. Yes. What you are doing here is find test. We have already imported the function from the simple script. And when calling the find average, it's calling the function inside simple script. And it's, it's, this is returning some kind of value. In our case, it's assigned to actual, and we are finally testing if actual is equal to expected. So expected means that uh, we have, uh, we have a uh, pre-prepared uh, test scenario, that means? Yes, we have prepared some test scenarios uh, because okay. We normally know what our functions are going to return. For any function that you are going to write or any method that you are going to write, you are expecting some kind of output from each function. Some functions might not return any type, so the expected case might be none. Uh, and if they are going to return zero, the expected going to be zero. If they are going to return uh, a, a, a list of some kind of data, you are going to check if, if it's an instance, the expected is an instance of a list or so on. So every function that you write or every method that you write in a class, you have some expected output. It might be none or some kind of value. Mm, I appreciate if uh, there is some mechanism uh, that uh, can automate this task because if, if the, um, the program or the module we are importing is really a, a complex program, uh, so uh, preparing a case scenario for every function of the module will be uh, by itself another task. Uh, is there any means to yes, automate I, this? I, I mean, how can you know, or how can you validate that uh, the function that you're writing uh, works correctly as you expect them? Uh, for, for example, as we, are, we have been saying in the Twitter data that you, were, you have been working on, how did you make sure that find favorite count is returning the, the right uh, data type and even the right values? How, how, how did you make sure that it's really extracting the favorite count from the Twitter data that you've been given? So okay. unit testing is trying to test each of the functions that you wrote or each of the method in a class that you wrote. And it's trying to verify or it's trying to validate that they are according to the expected output that you're expecting. So you are expecting find favorite count to 
return a list, and this list is containing the list of favorite counts of the tweets that have been uh, that are in the data, right? And the re the retweet count you are expecting to return a list of retweet counts that are in the data. So you need to make sure that first of all, it should be a type of list or an instance of a list, the return type. And finally, you can check by taking the top five data or the, uh, the, the top 10 data, and you can put the expected as the top 10 data because you already have the data and try to check if they are equal uh, with the return type of this specific function or this specific method. Okay. Okay. It's, it, it, Does it that make sense? Uh, it makes sense. Okay. Thank you. Uh, it, it it looks that uh, it's tedious. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I mean, in, in, in unit testing is why many software developers or even in data science and data engineering, most developers don't want to write unit tests. Especially, uh, yes, most of developers don't really want to write because it takes your time. It takes your energy and you are not only writing the code that you that you want to write because you are writing a test case for each code that you are writing but mm -hmm. in the long run when you are uh, writing a complex project or a complex program if you are not writing a unit test for each function you are writing you are simply adding bugs and bugs into your program and there will come a time that you won't be able to figure out the bug that's creating because your program might be complex and each of them might be dependent in each, to each other and it will make it much more harder uh, to write or uh, to taste what actually is creating the bug in your program. And I think most uh, programmers nowadays, they have two monitors when uh, programming and one of the monitor usually is to uh, write any tests using one of the monitor and writing the code uh, in the other monitor. And it's the process that you write it side by side. You won't leave that uh, to the end of the writing the program. You are going to do it side by side. You write the test and you write the code. Uh, we'll talk more about that, but for now, you might be writing the code and testing it side by side. Okay, okay, finest thing. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, Albert? Yes, yes. Okay, go on. Hello? Hello. Yeah, uh, yes. Uh, come on the screen. Come on the screen. Uh, which screen? Uh, yeah, yes, yes. But for me, I have uh, two problems. Like, for okay. example, uh, when you want to minimize the code, is it possible to. For here, you see, uh, you put expected. It's like a full, and then you have to put actually find average. So, is it possible for to take actually you could find average and you put on this asset equal and then you specify the value? Because is it, uh, is it, is it I it think, it, yes, it's uh, are you saying to put the values directly in the function or in the test case in the assert statement? Yes, yes, this is perfectly fine. Uh, uh, okay. Uh, another, I, I just have to uh, repeat. Another... It's, it's, it runs way well, but yeah. I did this yeah. because yeah. you'll make the program more readable for anyone that that's going to read the program. But either way, it works if you put them directly into your assert statement or uh, if you put them separately in your program. You just increase yeah. 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 increase the readability. Yeah. So uh, another another question is, so for example, when we are in doing some test of some things, uh, is it possible sometimes for to to get the earlier uh, test or the third test passed, but the result is comes for differently that you uh, you want to expect it? Uh, I'm I'm sorry, Onga, I didn't get that. Can you come again? Yeah, uh, I want to ask. Sometimes you see when you, uh, for example, when you want to, to take a test of uh, the, the person's disease, and then, uh, and then when you function to take that test, uh, you're waiting the result. Sometimes the result comes uh, the true, the, the negative or positive. 
So, for example, when when you see the someone affected to the disease, so sometimes you can you can change you can change the result after after test. Yeah, is it possible to, to change which which result? To change result from the the test you did. Uh, I, I'm sorry. I'm really sorry. I haven't got that again. Uh, maybe can you write that down? Okay. Let's go to to write on the message. Okay, Henok. Uh, let's continue the test cases. I think he uh, uh, wanted to say: uh, Is it easy to uh, cheat inside the unit test? I think yes. You can change the results in the unit test to make it pass. Uh, uh, just to make it work. Yes. When Even it's she, not. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Or, yes. Yes. Definitely. Why can because we are writing a program. I mean, I can't change the expected uh, uh, to be to one or maybe to be to two, and let's say find average isn't really returning the average, or it's, let me comment that out and let me return a plus b, a plus b, it should have returned the average, but it's now returning the uh, sum of the two numbers, and I can uh, simply say they expect it to be to two, and, and this should uh, run successfully. If this is what is my, yeah. is that my problem. Yeah. Yes, you can yes. because testing is after all something that you are writing. It's not trying to validate every or it doesn't. It's not related semantically to the function that was written. It is you or it is the uh, the role of the developer to write a test or a script that is working or that will try to validate the output that's being written by the function. So yes, you can. Okay, Wangui, uh, sorry if I'm mispronouncing your name. Uh, it's it's Wangui, it's okay. okay. Um, my question was, uh, if you could go back to uh, VS Code. Okay. Um, on line six, where you have sys.path.append in, for example, our unit test uh, file, it has um, os.path.abs path and like another one as well. Yes. Um, uh, what do those lines of code do? Like, can you do away with them? And like, cause the, the point of that line is to get like the path of yes. your file. Yes. Uh, I think let me maybe just show you. Uh, let me go to documents. Uh, let me go into our interactive sheet and let me import sys. And if I print sys.paz, uh, you can see sys.paz is just a list of different pauses. So each of the paths contains uh, different uh, packages. Most, I think all of them are Python paths and different paths that uh, Python uses to run your program. So by sys.paths, we mean when we try to append this specific script, we can't import, if I comment this out, how can you find or how can you import simple script from the other directory? Into your into your test directory. Okay, it doesn't work. It doesn't work. I think in other language, maybe in JavaScript or other programming language, some of them are uh, straightforward. You just have to uh, go out of the current directory, like uh, dot dot slash, and directly import those uh, scripts that you want to uh, import into your module. But in Python. The path is in the system, and if it's not in the current directory, it will try to look from the global path of Python configurations. So by adding, by appending this specific path to sys, we are saying that this script is included into the path, and when you try to import simple script, it will try to find simple paths from the uh, path that was appended in, uh, in line six. And 
this script also tries to do the same thing. And instead of I heard I manually uh, put the directory of the scripts pass, but by using os.pass.absolute pass, you can do it programmatically. This will find your absolute pass of the uh, directory that you are on, and it will append the scripts uh, directory to that pass. Oh, okay. So, for example, in the unit test um, Python file that we have, that line, we, we don't have to change it. Is that what you're saying? Because it's just going to look in our system for the uh, Python. You're referring to this line of code, right? Yes. Yes, you don't have to change that. You can't, this script won't work for you because this is specific to my uh, directory structure that I'm using. But for you, the Python's OS library will try to do that trick for you. And it will return the directory or of the current, uh, the directory path of your current directory that you're working on. Okay, okay, I understand now, thank you. Okay, great. Uh, any other question? Okay, Tadua. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. All right, so I am curious, is there a standard or do you maybe have a recommendation on whether to start with the unit test or to start with the actual code? Like when you're working, is it better to write the test first and then you start working on the actual code and you keep checking with the test? Or do, is it better to start with the actual code and then test it once you think you're done? That's a really nice question, Tadiwa. I think we are going to look at that in the next slide. Let me just finish what we started and we are going to talk about that later. Thank you for bringing uh, okay. that up. Okay, uh, great. Since time is going, let me just try to uh, add one more test and let me return back to original. Okay, so uh, this should be one. And uh, let's also try to one of the most common scenarios or one of the most common examples that's been given is, for example, let's try, try to find uh, the average, not the average, but let's try to divide two numbers. So there is A and B. So A is a type of integer and B is also a type of integer. And this should also uh, return the integer, it might be float, but let's just return an integer. And what we would do is return a slash b, a over b. So a over b will return the, uh, we will try to divide the number a, the first argument, by the second one, and this will return. So in your program, what I've been saying earlier is you are expecting this to work perfectly. So most of the time when the interaction with the user or you are expecting an input from someone else, you can't make sure that the user of your program is always using the arguments or inputting some parameters that you are expecting them to. They might input a string in B or A, or they might use a zero uh, for the place of B and dividing by zero will show an exception and will make your program to stop. So how, we, how can we test this? Or how can we make sure that uh, the test script will validate that and won't allow uh, our users to input other numbers. So let's just try to write a script. So our script will be test divide. It's dividing them. And uh, I think I also have to import that. So what are we expecting first? Let's, we are expecting, for example, uh, the return, to return two and the actual will be Uh, we are going to pass 4 and 2. So 4 divided by 2, we return 2, right? So we are good. So if I assert the statement expected with the actual, it should work, right? 4 divided by 2 is 2. So if I run, two tests are, uh, two tests run successfully and we are good to go. But what if I pass zero for the second argument? So four divided by zero should uh, is raising is going to raise an exception. So if I now run 
two tests are run, but one of them uh, is failing. So what you'd normally put in your test cases or what you are going to test most of the time or your expected value, you are going to first test for the straightforward program. So for example, four divided by two should return to. You are also going to add some additional or uh, test cases or edge cases that your program might fail. For example, you might add zero for this program. What will the program return if zero is uh, given as an input? What will the program when minus one is given as an input? One is a given as an output as an input and different, not many inputs, but you'll test using the normal program flow. You'll also include to uh, try to add some edge cases so that you'll be sure or you'll make sure that your program uh, will work accordingly. So if you now test this, uh, the test is failing because four divided by zero, uh, it will definitely return uh, an error and that will not work. So what you can do is before dividing the two numbers, we can check if B, if B is, is equal to zero, we'll have to raise some kind of error. So this shouldn't work. So normally this will raise a value error and we'll raise a value error, let's say with uh, X message division by zero, not, not allowed. So how would you test this? This is running perfectly or this will, uh, this won't uh, stop the program or if the user tries to divide a number by zero, he will get, he or she will get uh, the output that you are expecting. So this specific case has been handled by our program. Now, if we try to run our program, uh, what do you think we will get? As you can see, the tests are still failing because we are not testing for that specific, uh, because we are expecting it to return to two, but actually it's not returning to. So what we can do is we are going to assert and there is another uh, method that is in the unit test, which is assert traces. So our assert traces does is it will take the type of uh, assertion or exception that has been created. So in our case, it's value error. And then the second is the name of the method, which is divide them. And the inputs that the method or the function is expecting. So it's a bit different from the previous assertions. So in assert equal, you will give the expected and the, you will call the function directly. But here, you will have to put first the type error that's going to be the, ex, the type of exception that's been that's going to be strong. And finally, you'll call the function, not directly in parentheses, using parentheses, but you'll put the parameters separately uh, by, specif by specifying them, uh, by separating them with comma. So if I now try to run, two tests are failing. Division by zero is okay. Let me just try. Hmm. Assert raises value error. It's raising a value error. And divide them. And divide it by. I think uh, you, you should have to uh, make the uh, return statement under the if block. Uh, no, actually, this is going to raise the error directly if P is going to be zero. But after raising it, it is dividing it. Return is out of Oh, the I'm sorry. Loop. I'm yeah. sorry. Thank you. If Thank you. Uh, I can else put an else statement here and yeah. this, will, this should work well. Thank you. Perfect. Uh, maybe I should change the test case. And yes, perfect. Thank you. Uh, so this is going to handle, we can also write different uh, assertions and if the input is going to be four and two, it should 
give the expected outcome. And if the input for the B parameter is going to be zero, this should not work or should raise a value error. So what self dot assert raise does is it will uh, try to check the exception returned when the function is being called with the given parameters. So if I now run the program, it still works fine. So you can add other of uh, other uh, checks for your function so that you will make sure each of the test cases for the edge case as well as the normal flow would work. Is that a question, Josias? Yes, I have noticed that when you are using the asset phrase, we didn't put the parameters of the of the function in brackets. It's like yes, yes, yes. So asset traces, I think there is also another way. I'm not sure about that, but asset traces uh, accepts its parameters to be uh, used by separating them with commas. So yeah. the first thing that it, it expects is the type of assertion and the function call with the parameters being passed by uh, separating them using commas. This is the way that they defined it. Okay, all right. Okay, uh, Ayman. Hi, thank you for the presentation. I just have a question. How to control the number of digits, for example, in the division, if the return value, like it's approximated to five digits, or six and um, like your actual value like into 10 or the opposite vice versa how can you control this uh, are you referring to the output of the function or the expected value in the test case i mean both of them when you compare them if there is a like uh an approximation inside okay, the i function. think uh, there is also another a class which assert yeah. almost equal yes what assert almost equal is uh, it will try it, if I'm not wrong, it will, um, uh, it will check, if we, we can see here that it will fail if the two objects are equal or it come by the defense, rounded. So this will give some, uh, this will allow for some kind of difference in the two, uh, yeah. two, in the two values that are given in the expected and the actual, so that we can use and make sure that if they are equal, not exactly equal, but almost equal. Thank you. Yes, sure. There are other methods as well we can use, and uh, by using them, we can make sure that our program is working correctly. Uh, okay, time is going. I think we can continue to the next session. Okay, Ajat. Ajat, Ajat. sorry. Hi. Uh, I, I was going to talk about the almost equal. What's the range? Uh, when will it give us almost equal? What if we are expecting one and we got 10? Will that still be almost equal? I don't know the kind of the kind of uh, value it's going to return. Uh, okay, I'm not exactly sure what the range uh, for it to work is, but when you do use assert, why would you use uh, assert almost equal? Is for example, you are going, you are making, or you are doing some kind of calculation, and they might not be exactly equal, specific, uh, especially when there are cases with uh, much uh, larger number with longer rounds, longer number of rounds, or longer number of fractions, you, you don't expect them to be exactly equal, right? There might be some difference, but a very tiny difference. So what you have to use is almost equal instead of uh, uh, exactly equal or assert, assert equal. But I'm not exactly okay. sure what the exact range or the exact difference uh, it should be for it to work. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, so going on, the next one is test-driven development. Uh, I think test-driven development or TD is really uh, famous and popular in the software development. Uh, but in, when it comes to data engineering or data science related, data related projects, uh, it's not that popular, but what it is, is it's a development practice that focuses on creating unit tests before developing the actual code. So what I've done earlier is I wrote a script or I wrote some kind of functions and expected uh, and then wrote a test case for those functions uh, to be tested. 
But what case-driven development does is it will first write case cases for each of the functions, and finally, you'll start writing the function that the test scripts or the test cases has been written. So the simple concept of TV is to write and correct the failed tests. So when you first write your test or your test case, that test case or those test cases will definitely fail, right? Because you haven't written any script in your uh, simple script or in your program that you are going to program. So after the program fails, the next step is to write a function or a write, write a code which will pass by the, which will pass based on the test script that has been written. So this will help to avoid duplication of code as we write a small amount of code at a time in order to pass a test. And mostly TDD or test driven development is used in agile process. So you'll define the function that you want or you'll probably know what kind of functions you want to write. Then you'll write a, se a separate test scripts for each of the functions that you want. And finally, go on to write the scripts that uh, will uh, pass by the test. So the steps are first, thinking about test cases. So thinking is the similar with the unit test or the previous approach that uh, I showed you. So you'll first have to think and you'll you have to know what test cases that you, you have to write. Test cases simply refer to the program or to the functions that you are going to code. So the next step is read. Read meaning uh, failure of test cases because you haven't written any program, the test case will definitely fail. And the second, the third phase is green. By green, uh, we mean that the code in the gate, the new test case will pass. And we'll also ensure that this is really important. Uh, when you add a new case or when you add a new function to your uh, code base, you need to make sure that all of the codes or all of the functions or all of the methods in your class are also working. Because when you add a new program to your uh, code base, that new program shouldn't affect the old code that you wrote. Because if you are writing a new program that affects the old code, you are starting you'll be starting to create new bugs into your program and it will be harder uh, to debug so you'll make sure that first the code that you wrote or the function that you wrote is working correctly that's the green phase and you'll also make sure that the new code uh, is not affecting the previous code that you wrote and finally it's to refactor the uh, program that you wrote and we'll repeat the cycle so the cycle looks like this, this is the flow diagram of the uh, TDD. So you add a test and you run the test. It will you'll make sure that it will fail and make a little change. Run the test and it's a continuous loop uh, of writing a code and testing uh, your code. So you'll first write a code and it will fail. Then you'll uh, fix it by writing the function that you want it to be tested. Then you'll make sure that it passes. You don't only make sure that the code section passes, but you'll also make sure that it's not affecting the rest of the program. And finally, you will refactor uh, your code as a whole and the loop will go on. So one of the best things when using uh, this approach is first, not only this approach, but in general testing is, you'll make sure that your code is refactored and you'll make sure that you are not repeating some code sections uh, in different places. One of the most popular, uh, uh, one of the most popular uh, approach for developing the software or in the data science as well is the dry principle. So the dry pr principle is do not repeat yourself. So every time you're writing a function, sometimes what will happen is you're writing a function that's duplicate or redundant. You're writing the same code again and again. So by using this approach, you'll first write a specific test case, you, then you'll write the code section for that, then you are refactoring the program. So it will enable you to remove part of the program that are duplicated and some of them that aren't necessary in the program. And it will make you, it will enable you to write much more cleaner code and uh, better programs and works well in an agile uh, uh, process. So it's really popular and most used uh, principle in the software development, but sometimes in the data related projects, uh, there are things that you don't have to use uh, TDD or test driven development approach. So for example, when you are going to explore a data source, when the data source that you are going to work is, uh, isn't familiar to you at all, or you are going just to explore the data that 
that's coming or you are going to work on, it's not best to write a uh, test case approach or to use the test driven development approach because uh, you don't even know what you're expecting or you don't even know uh, what the data would look like. So you'll first write the function and you'll extract it and have a look at it, then uh, continue working on the uh, other code sections or other functions, then you are going to test them. And it's also not based when you are working with a complete and manageable data source. For example, if you completely have an understanding of the data or it's in your control, if the, all of the data are uh, being added by someone you know, or by someone you know, I mean, from a, from a trusted source, then you don't necessarily have to follow this approach. But in other cases, when you know the program, not that well, but you might expect some kind of, uh, when you know the expected uh, outputs of the program that you are going to write, then this is the best approach to write or to follow for developing your program. So uh, I will also try to go over a test-driven approach uh, program or uh, test-driven uh, development uh, program. So the first thing that you do is this will also follow the similar structure. The tests are in the test folder in the scripts or the preprocessing scripts for this. I put a preprocessing script in the scripts directory. And the first thing is to write tests that will fail. After writing tests, you'll start writing the program or the scripts that the test is going to run them and check if they are valid. So I've just written uh, or I've just declared the method names for each of the uh, for each of the function that uh, that's going to be run. So this is going to be some kind of sample of an NLP project, which will try to preprocess the data. Uh, by preprocessing is a very simple preprocessing, which will just try to change, uh, which will remove the mentions detect if the tweet is a retweet and will remove non-alpha numeric characters and detect any empty tweets, select while tweet. So let's first try to see the uh, the test cases that uh, we have to write. So in PyTest, if you are using PyTest, there is a method called PyTest.Fixture. So PyTest.Fixture, what PyTest.Fixture does is it will uh, run the specific method before your test cases are run. So when defining or when giving a pytest.fixture, uh, it's a decorator, you'll make sure that that specific code section will run before any of the test cases are executed. So for now, let's just use uh, this pytest fixture. So what it does is I just defined a function which will uh, contain problematic tweets. So uh, they contain the at symbol and this is a retweet and this is a Chinese character, which isn't uh, alphanumeric uh, character. And the fourth one contains an empty uh, string. So the first test that we are going to make or we are going to write is, uh, we are going to remove the mention. So if you are passing, if you are passing the first, uh, the first element of the list, this should return an empty string the remove mentions that we are going to write here. I've just commented here, just uh, by using pass, we'll, uh, nothing will run this uh, uh, method in the class. So we are expecting when when we pass the first or the zeros index of the list, this should return, the remove mentions should return an empty string because this contains a, the at symbol. So it will uh, remove the whole word from the list. and. The second is to detect the, if a tweet is a retweet. So we are going, we just want to retain or we just want to have uh, of tweets that aren't tweet, retweeted. We, we only want the original tweet. So if you also pass the retweeted uh, field to the detect retweet, it will return if the retweet, if, if this specific element is a retweet or not. And the third one will remove the alphanumeric character. So these Chinese characters or I think they are Chinese characters. Someone correct me if I'm wrong. So if 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 it forms non-alphanumeric characters, which is by alphanumeric we mean uh, only characters or letters from A to Z, both upper and smaller, lower, and also digits starting from zero to nine. So it will remove all of the non-alphanumeric characters from the 
uh, string that, that has been passed to it. So this should be removed and this should return an empty string. So we are testing if our function is going to return an empty string. The, the remove null alpha numeric uh, method in our class is going to return an empty string. And finally, forget about this, uh, we are going to detect if, if it's an empty tweet because some of the tweets or when uh, working with tweets with Twitter data set, some of them might be empty. So we are going to check if it's an empty tweet. So if it's an empty tweet, we are going to assert and this will just basically return a Boolean, which is true or false. So if it's, if it's an empty tweet, it will return true. And if it's not, it will return false. So the scripts, I've already written the scripts, but all of them doesn't include the code section. So by test driven development, we will first write the test case and we will then go and write the function. Uh, because of time, I'm showing you the whole function code that when in practice you are writing where, or you are following TDD approach, you will first write this specific test case and you will go on and write this specific uh, method that's in the class. And it will be an iterative uh, process. So you will first make sure that the code is failing or the test is not uh, uh, passing. Then you'll go and uh, write the function or fill up the function and you'll make sure the code is running as well as it's not, uh, uh, it's not failing the previous code that you have wrote. So let me just try to run this using PyTest. So, when running PyTest, all of the tests are failing. Just imagine that when actually working on a TD or, or when following TD approach, you will be running each of the test cases uh, separately, or you will first write the first test case, then uh, fill up or finish up the first method. Then you will go on and uh, start to create new test cases for each of the functions that you are running. So all of the functions are uh, failing, and let me uncomment the first one. So it will this by using a regular expression. Uh, there is a package in Python. It's a built-in package which is re. After you import it, by using a regular expression, it will try to uh, look for anything for any word that starts with the at, and it will replace it with an empty string from the uh, word that's given. So, if this specific function receives this word at somebody it's going to replace it with the empty string and this function should return an empty string because return re.sub is going to replace the, uh, the at somebody word with an empty string. So this should pass. So if I now run my test, one is passing and four, four tests are failing. So you can go on to each of the uh, functions that we defined and make sure that they're running. So now four tests are passing and one is failing. And finally, in a normal project, what you do is you test all of the functions. So you have different uh, functions in your, you have different methods in your class, which will remove and which will detect if it's a retweet or not in different other scenarios. And finally, you will have to combine all of the uh, tweets or use all of the data set and make some kind of preprocessing. So test tweet selection is taking a whole tweet, good and bad tweets, this is another fixture that I've defined above. So what this returns is, it will return all of the tweets that are uh, in, my, in, my, in my data set. So I just uh, took sample of them. So the first one is an empty string. The second one is it contains at somebody which at that it contains an at symbol. The third one is a clean tweet. I will survive with a clean tweet. It doesn't have any special character. It doesn't include that symbol. And it also doesn't have any uh, non-alphanumeric character. So by taking this, this specific feature is returning uh, the whole list or which contains good and bad tweets. And it's trying to test if the good and bad tweet is returning only a single element because all of the data, other data, other than the I will survive uh, tweet, aren't the way that we are uh, expecting them. 
or when you are pre-processing a text for any kind of NLP project, you want to remove some of the characters that you don't want, or sometimes you might even want to remove all of the uh, rows that aren't uh, as your requirement or as the way that you want them. And when all of, when select while tweets or function runs, it will remove all of the uh, tweets that aren't in the format that you want them, and it should only return one, because only one of the tweets are in a format that we want them to be. So what select file tweets does is, it's basically kind of a pipeline. So by using list comprehension for each tweet, it will first run the detect retweet, and it will only uh, include in the program that aren't retweets, that, 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 are, that aren't retweeted. So by using this, by writing this line of code, we will make sure that only tweets that aren't retweeted are included are included in the no retweets uh, variable. So this is a list, and after the, after getting this list, we are going to remove uh, non alpha numeric characters from this list, and also remove mentions from the list. It's kind of a pipeline by iteratively going through the functions or preposing scripts we want, and finally getting the clean tweets. And while tweets will only return after by using the clean tweets or the pre-processed tweet uh, by the, by the pre-processed tweets it will also uh, go over additional uh, cleaning and it will only include tweets that aren't empty so it will remove all of the empty tweets from the tweet list in the clean tweet and these valid tweets should only contain tweets that that, that doesn't contain uh, special characters or empty empty tweets or retweeted tweets and non alphanumeric characters so since we passed tweets, the first one is empty, the second one correct, uh, uh, includes the at symbol, only the third one is in the correct format. So what we are checking in test tweet selection is, we are, we are checking for two, uh, we, are, we are using two test cases. The first one is the length of the tweet selection, since it's going to return a list, finally it's returning a list. The length of the tweets, selection should be one because only one of the tweet is in the format that we want it to be and we are also checking if it's an instance of a list so as i have said earlier you can check the instance of the method that you are going to test is in, in, in is an instance of the class that you want it to be so it should be a list it might be a tuple it might be an integer it might be a string so you can make sure that it's an instance of the uh, type data type that you want it to be so if i now run the whole uh, program of five all of them are passing there is a, a, a warning i think it's uh loose version it might be uh, some kind of version problem but what we can see that is all of the test cases are running uh, successfully so in test driven development what you will do is you will first write a test case for the function that you want uh, to execute, then write the function and make sure that the test case passes. And also the program as a whole is also passing and the new function that you wrote isn't affecting the old program that you wrote. And finally, uh, trying to refactor the code. Uh, is, is it clear? Yeah, yes. I have a question. Okay, just yes. When you explained the unit test before, I was expecting you to use asset equal. So I would like to know what is the difference between asset and asset equal. Okay, so asset equal is uh, a specific method available in unit testing, in the unit test uh, library that you, you we used earlier. But okay, thank you. You also reminded me something that I have to show you. Mm, yes. So in your test case, sometimes you want something uh, to be run before any of the test cases run. So there is, you, you might have already seen that uh, in your uh, challenge document, there is a function or there is a method called setup, right? So what setup does is, if setup, so what setup does is it will 
basically try to declare something that you want for your whole test cases. So let's say test find average wants to access some kind of data that's, uh, that might be similar to both of them. So you will define some kind of parameter. Let's say, I think in, your, in the challenge document, you will define your data frame here and it will contain all of the data that uh, you want it to include. So the, every test cases that you are going to write next will have access to this data frame because what setup does is it will run before every test case, uh, before every of the, before each of the test cases are run in your uh, test script. So by using setup, you can make sure that you give access to each test case, uh, the variables that you, you define here. And uh, by also defining this tier down, yes, tier down, uh, you can also write other script so that after each test case run, this script is going to execute. Maybe I think it's best to show you a print setup. And print there down. Uh, something is failing. Let me just comment everything out. I'm going to assert. I'm sorry. So, uh, as you can hear, like, as you can see here, first setup is run, then teardown is run, then setup is again run, and teardown is run. So, what's happening is the setup script, this specific method, is running before each of the test cases are run, and the teardown is running after each of the test cases uh, are run. So if you have 10 test cases, the setup and the teardown uh, will be run uh, 10 times. But there is also another uh, method. Not, it's not a method, but it's a class instance that you can uh, use. And these class methods run when the class is instantiated, not for each test case. So when you say setup class, and just pass it for now in class method here, here down class. So maybe let me also print this and here down class. Uh, excuse me. Okay. Uh, Christians? Yes, what's the line uh, and the class method is, is it doing? The class method, what the class method does is it's a decorator to run, which will uh, enable you to run this method that you are defining as a class method instead of a regular method. So every other classes, every other, sorry, every other methods that you are using are methods of a class, but this is a special decorator, which will enable you to run the following method that you are going to declare as a class instance. So by class instance, I mean that you won't pass the self uh, cured. So this is a class instance which will only be run once the class is instantiated. And the teardown class is going to run when the program ends or when the execution uh, for this specific uh, test module ends. So it's a decorator which will just enable you to run it as a class instance, not as a method inside the class. Okay, I get it. Okay, so now if I print, if I run this program, you can see that setup class is first run, then setup is run, teardown is run, setup is run, teardown is run. So setup and teardown are run for every 
takes keys that you have written. But setup class and teardown class are only run once in your program. So the setup class is run once your program starts or once the program starts execution, and the teardown class runs when the program ends. So it might be, for, exa for example, just for example, when you want to make a database connection, you just want to make it once. You might use mocks or some other things, but if you, are, if you want to get data from a database, you might use that in a setup class. So you don't want to make a connection to the database again and again for each test case. So in your setup class, you'll make a connection to the, to the database and in the teardown uh, class, you will maybe uh, finish that connection or stop that connection that you have with the database. And setup is for something that you might want to initialize and that each of the th test cases will want to access that specific data from the setup class. So since setup and teardown are run for every test cases, you will be able to access the data that are put in the setup class. Please explain once more. Uh, okay, about the setup class or? Yes, about the setup class, the first and the second, the teardown class also. Okay, so the setup class, okay, maybe let me just try to explain more about the setup and teardown. Setup and teardown are run every time your test cases are executed. So for example, test find average, when test find average is going to be, this execution isn't sequentially or the order, it's not in the order that they are put, but it will, the program might start from, uh, for, let me just show you by testing find average and this is testing divide. Okay, I put that twice. So if I now run this, so you can see the setup class is executed. The first thing that's executed, then there is the setup for a specific test case. So testing divide was the second uh, test case that we defined, but as I have said, the, uh, the ordering doesn't matter. So the test case or the test script run the test divide first. So the setup and the teardown or this test case are also run. Then the next thing is the setup for the second script or for the second test case, which is testing the find average and setup and teardown are being run for each test case that you define. But the setup class and the teardown class are only run once for the module that you are going to run. So what you would normally use them for uh, the, 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 one of the common scenarios, it might not be the common scenarios, you might use other things to access database instead of accessing, accessing it directly. But if you want to make a database connection for your test and you want to get or you want to fetch some data from your database and put it in some variable, you lose setup class because you don't want to make a database, a, a database connection for each of the test keys that you are going to run. So if you use setup or teardown, these scripts are going to be executed uh, for each of the test cases that are going to be run next. But if you run or if you use setup class and teardown class, you'll make sure that the database connection is made only once and uh, you can uh, finally destroy the object that you made, uh, that you used to make connection to the, to the database. Okay, it's clear, but yeah. what is the difference between the setup class and, and tier down class? Uh, setup tier down class and setup class. What is the difference between them? Because if I and I, I got you, it's like we have a choice. Yes, between the setup class and the tier down class. Yeah, yes. Is the it setup, that? Yes, I, there is a difference between those between the two class methods. The setup class is being run when your program starts the execution. It's the first thing that's executed. So for example, you might want to test some of the data in your database, just as an example. So yeah. in your setup class, what you would do is you will fetch some data from your database and put it in a variable or in you'll store it somewhere in your setup class. Yeah. And teardown class won't run until all of the methods in your class uh, finish executing. So 
in your teardown class, you can use some kind of logic to destroy the object that you use to connect to the, to the database. So you will close the connection to the, to the database once you finish executing each of the scripts or each of the test cases that you uh, that you are going to run. So teardown class is going to run once the test scripts or the test case that you wrote finishes executing. So it's the last thing that will run in your program, the teardown class. Okay. But the setup class is something that's going to run uh, first or the first thing that's going to run once you, when you start your executing your test cases. It's clear now, so thank you very okay. much. So this is also similar for the setup in teardown. The setup is going to run uh, for every instance of the test case that you are going to run. So if you have 10 test cases, the setup and the teardown class are going to be called 10 times, while the setup class and the teardown class are only going to be called once. Okay. Yeah, like, uh, uh, yes, yes. Uh, for another programming language, we use the uh, before class and after class uh, in unit testing. Sometimes when we use the before class, we want to create data. When the table created automatically, the before class helps you to generate that tables. And when you want to uh, to clean that, I use after class. So in here, uh, class method, it's 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 very well like that. Uh, yeah. uh, what what's the first thing that you mentioned for which program were you, were you taking the setup class? I thought it was for the Python testing module. Yeah. Okay, so. Are, are, you, are you saying that this setup class is similar to this setup or uh, I haven't got your question? Okay, I want to ask uh, this class method. It's okay. Class method. Okay. The, the creator's class method. Yeah, I, I said in the other programming language like Java, when we are going to, to test some things, so we set the before class and after class. So okay. here, the class method, it's, it's like the same. Uh, okay, I, I'm not familiar with testing in Java, but uh, if those methods are also running uh, before the instantiation or the first thing that are going to run when you instantiate the class and the teardown in Java is also going to run when you when the class finish execution, yes, they are going to be similar with that. But I'm not familiar with uh, testing in Java. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I will, I will. Okay, yes, I think it's mostly similar. You'll also find similar concept in JavaScript. You'll, I'm sure you also find something similar in Java. C++. Every language have some kind of similar structure when testing, when it comes to testing, even also when writing the program. So you'll definitely find something similar. Uh, Adjat? Uh, sorry. I don't know my okay. hands. So. Okay, no problem. So I think time is already uh, gone, but let me just uh, go to the Twitter data analysis. And uh, so having what you discuss in mind, I think it's uh, much more clear that what you are going to do or what you are supposed to do, the functions are already, the methods are already defined for you. So you can, follow the TDD approach for this. But, uh, if you haven't already started writing the program or have finished, have already completed the program. So you can go to the test folder and there is a test for the extracting data frame. And you should also include a test for the clean tweet uh, data frame uh, module. You will also, you might also include other preprocessing scripts for your uh, challenge. And you'll also include other additional uh, test cases or test modules that you want. So what you do here is first you'll have to uh, get the data or take some kind of sample because if you have, let's say a million of row, a data that contains millions of rows or billions of rows, you are not going to include all of the, all of the data or all of the data to be tested automated in, in an automated way using GitHub Actions or something. We are going to discuss more about that later, but you will just take the sample of the data and 
you will make sure that the data is in the format that you want it to be. So there are different methods that you used when extracting. There is the find size count, find full text count, find sentiments, find credit time. So we want to make sure that, for example, the find credit time method is actually returning, it's a list, it returns a list first. You will make sure that, you have to make sure that it's uh, an instance of a list. Then you will also want to make sure that the credit times are extracted correctly. So for example, I just used the wavesheet.json data that have that we've been uh, that we have collected on Monday and I formatted it so that we just we can be able to see the fields that are in the in the JSON file. So the first thing that you you do is first you will import the data. So the data might be uh, yes in slash data in wave stream. To JSON. So after you get the data, this data is uh, again, this is only the sample of the total data that we have. I've only took five of the data and put it so that I can make sure that the extraction phase is working correctly. So these are the columns and in the setup class, as you can see, the setup class is run for every test case that are going to be run later. So for the setup class, I give the Twitter, the tweet diff extractor and only took the, at the first five, this won't matter because I only took uh, the five of the, the five, only the five, the top five tweets. And after assigning to the data frame, when we test, when, when we are going to start testing each of the methods that are in the fix extract data frame uh, module, we are going to assert or we are going to make sure that the find status counts, when we run the find status counts will be equal to the status count that we are expecting. For example, in the formatted text, uh, for example, we can find the status count. Uh, what was the type of data for the status count? Can anyone? Yes, status count. It's actually a number. So you should find for the five data or for the five tweets that we collected, we should five, find five status count. And we need to make sure that this is actually equal with the data that we are expecting or with the data that we have. For, for example, we can put it in a list and this is what we mean by the expected uh, data that we have, uh, that I have showed you earlier in the previous uh, uh, base code document. So we expect the first one to be uh, this amount of number and also the second one to be uh, it's it's not uh, 127 and so on so you'll check you'll call the method directly by the, the you have already imported the module so after importing the module the tweet data frame extractor you will call the find status count method directly and you will make sure that the return is actually equal to these values or to these expected values that you have. So for each of the methods or for each of the test cases that you have, you are going to test if the return type or if the find status count or find sentiments, find full text are actually returning the data types that are expecting them and the values that they are expecting them. So for example, let's say when you are going to return, uh, uh, for example, you want the hashtag. So hashtag here is a nested element. You can find it in entities. So find hashtag. So you accidentally say that hashtags are, let me just copy this one and you try to access hashtags directly in the self tweets. This is wrong because hashtags are, uh, hashtag is nested inside entities. So you will have to first specify the entities and the hashtag. So you will make sure by testing, by writing in test, you will make sure that each of the methods inside your class are actually accessing or actually extracting the data that you want them. So you will check for the return data type and finally the values that they are returning by taking only the sample of the data. Of the data. So if you have billions of rows, you won't need to take all of the data to test them you will only need a sample or for your expected value, you will only put some 
value from the data and make sure that they are equal with the actual value. Okay, Georgias? Yeah, uh, in the framework of, uh, of our challenge, so I would like to know if we consider that I have I have done already the unit test on the extract uh, script. Will I mean the game another unit test in the framework of this this challenge? Uh, for other modules or for the same module? No, for other modules because I don't know. Uh, me especially i have done the unit test already so i would like to know if i will be using it again after uh i think for the other modules as well for the same module if i've already completed that perfect you'll have to also automate that and uh, make sure that it will pass on the continuous integration once you push it to the to your uh, github branch we'll be seeing that later but for the new scripts that you are going to write you will be using the same methods that used for uh, fixed extract data frame uh, modules that used to test that, to test it. Oh, okay. Now I have a question. When I was, I was trying to perform my unit test, I, uh, in order to provide the first five data, I mm -hmm. put another script to extract them. I read the JSON file and I tried to, take the, the first five. I didn't make a copy of them in the script. So I would like to know if it is wrong or not. But the, the test worked when I, I found it. Yeah, I think it doesn't matter where your data is coming. So the only thing that if your data that you copied or that you took has a similar structure to the data that we are going to use, to the data set that we are going to use, it won't matter because after all, the test scripts are just there to test if your methods inside the class are extracting the values properly. So yeah. when they're supposed to return a list, they're they are not returning none. Or when they're supposed to return a value or a number, you need to make sure that it's not returning an empty string or some other data types that you are not expecting. So as long as you data that you get that you're using is or has a similar structure to the data set that you have been given it doesn't matter at all okay. because it, it just means that your uh, scripts inside your class are working well, well in extracting the methods or extracting the values that you want okay okay so thank you very much no problem margaret um, do you mean to tell me that when getting the data for the f the first five data sets, the first five data for Twitter can be any data? It doesn't even have to be from Africa, Twitter, or the global one. Uh, okay. I mean, if, I, I, if I the... think it's it, it's based to take the data from the global or from the one that you are going to extract. Uh, I just said that to uh, Josias earlier because if the data that you are going to take the sample has a similar structure to the data that you are working on, it doesn't matter. But I think it's it's based. Let's just put it this way: it's based to take the data that you are going to be working on. To take the samples, it's based to take samples from the data that you are going to work on. But you can also take other data if they have the similar structure with the data that you have currently, because after all, the Twitter data. In the Twitter data extraction, we are just trying to uh, extract the fields, and these fields are consistent in the Twitter, in the Twitter data collection. So that won't matter. But I think just to avoid confusion, just take the the data from the data that you are going to work on, or from the data that you are going to extract on for the test case as well. Margaret. Um, yeah, that makes sense. Thanks. Okay. Uh, any other question? Any challenge that you have faced when trying to write unit tests for this challenge, for this week's challenge? Or something that's unclear on the presentation or from what you've been doing?
okay i hope that that signal and i hope everyone will write a unit test for this week's challenge and uh hopefully everyone's test works and we also pass uh, by using the github actions that we're going to learn more in the next session and great perfect uh, uh okay i think the powerpoints are already okay i will maybe zip the code section the code and zip it and i will zip it and upload it to the google drive that's up now okay I think that's it. I took okay. We have tried additional tests. Yes, uh, 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 the find function or the test for the find extract data frame is only going to test the meters or the yes the meters inside the find extract data frame. So there are also other functions. So for example, in the clean tweets data frame, you have to drop unwanted columns, drop duplicates. You will also have to test these meters that you have. Maybe later, you are also going to write, as we have seen yesterday's session, for topic modeling, you'll have to pre-process your data. You'll have to remove some punctuations, special characters. You'll have to perform some kind of uh, staining or any other pre-processing script. So you are going to write a test for the functions that you are going to write. So I think there is only one test uh, module in the GitHub template that you've been given, but you'll have to add additional tests for every module that you are going to include. Uh, okay, then. So, okay, I, I have a, yes, I have a question. What if the others, the other modules are, are written in, in Jupyter Notebook and we don't have a, a Python script for them? How to? Yes, I think one of the best thing about testing is this it will enable you to refactor your code. So in your Jupyter notebook, you are going to write some kind of, pre you are going to make some kind of pre-processing. Maybe, let's say, uh, you are going to work on topic modeling, right? So on a Saturday session, we have seen that we have used or we have defined the pre-processing script in the Jupyter notebook. So what you can do is you'll move the pre-processing scripts separately and you'll move them to the scripts directory or any directory that you want that will put the scripts and you will import those scripts and use them in the pre in the Jupyter notebook that you are going to use. So uh, let's say you have a pre, -pre a pre processing script and you will import that pre processing script in your notebook and you will be using the methods available in the pre processing script. And okay. that way you will refactor your code and also make sure that your scripts are working and you will not repeat yourself again and again. So for example, if you are using, if you, if you have, let's say three notebooks, three different notebooks, you don't have to write the pre-processing scripts in the three se separate notebooks. If you have them in a separate directory, you can import those scripts in your notebooks and use them again and again without repeating yourself. All right. So that way your program is much more cleaner and shorter in terms of code, length of no code and it will be more readable for others that are going to go over your program. Right. Okay. okay. Thank you. Johannes, uh, does that answer your question as well? Yes, you did. Okay, great. Uh, it's been almost two hours. Uh, sorry for that again. And I hope everyone will uh, write in this for each of the modules that you are going to implement for the preprocessing, for the clean tweet, as well as the extraction. Uh, yes, that's it. Thanks. Thank you, guys. Uh, let me stop the recording and